All right, here he is, Tavon Wilson. Man, it is, uh, it's great to see you, hear you. Like we were just saying, I think it's been two years since we connected like this. And um, I think a lot of our listeners, readers, remember just your inspirational story. I'm going to be honest, you know, before we hit record on that two years ago, I didn't really know anything about you off the field. And uh, I just think like your journey from, you know, growing up as a kid and the, the trauma and everything you went through then through college at Illinois, through the NFL, a decade in the NFL, uh, New England, Detroit, Indianapolis, and San Francisco there at the end. it's I mean, that's like the, the true NFL story, right? We we tend to glamorize guys and uh, mythologize players, like be, make them bigger than life. Well, I mean, you went through the ups and downs of what life's really like in the pros, which is why, why we love you. And, man, it's just great to see you again. Yeah, Tyler, thanks for having me, man. It's definitely uh... – it was a long journey, man, and uh, you know I wouldn't change my journey for anything. Um, it's a bigger part of you know who I am today, and to be able to you know play all those years in the NFL and get that great experience. Uh, I mean, I'm not gonna lie, it was a bottle, um, a lot of ups and downs, but it was a, it was fun. It was my journey. Um, it was a, in everything I could ever dreamed of. Uh, won a lot of games, uh, won some championships, so um, it's been great to be able to you know sit down and enjoy those things and look back on it. A full decade, right? That had to have been a goal. Get a, get a full ten years in. Oh, for sure, that definitely was. Uh, I'll say, you know, after you know, kind of getting you know vested in three years, uh, after like three and a half years, uh, Brian Flores had told everyone all the safeties in our room, you know, that we could play ten years. So, you know, once he kind of said that, um, that was kind of my turn into my goal. So, um, once I got the ten years. Um, I could say that, uh, you know, I felt like I was at the mountaintop and, you know, uh, being able to win a Super Bowl and experience those things. Uh, so I'll say I accomplished all my goals while I was in the game. I mean, we haven't really caught up nearly as much as uh, as we should, so sorry about that. But, man, how did things finish up? 2021 in San Francisco, uh, when we last spoke, you were kind of in the decision-making process of of where to sign. You go to the Niners. I think you ended up on IR right in November, mid November ish. Yeah. Yep. Um, and then decided to retire after that. But like, how since we last spoke and connected, um, how how was that move to go to San Francisco? Um, it was good. I mean, I think it started out great. You know, um, all the guys were great. You know, I think they have a great locker room, and um, Kyle and John is building something great over there. And you know, I was grateful for my opportunity. You know, to be able to be. You know, a part of the organization for, you know, that year. You know, we finished up on the NFC Championship. I, I was on IR, but you know, I spent a lot of time with the team, you know, even after going on IR. Um, but on the field side, it was fun. Um, I think I started out hot in training camp. Um, I thought I was going to get an opportunity to kind of go out there and start and play again um, and didn't really get that opportunity. But um, it was what it was, you know, supported the guys, you know, as much as I could. And um, I got an opportunity to start in my last game. So um, that was fun for me. Um, it was, it was, uh, I think I broke my foot like the 25th play of the game. Um, but I just said, man, just go ahead and just ride it out. You know what I mean? I just went ahead and finished the game because, you know, I knew, you know, for me to accomplish playing in 10 years, you know, that was my goal and I was there and I kind of felt my foot. So I was like, well, I mean, what you got to lose, just go ahead and go finish the game. So uh, it was fun as hell. Uh, I had a whole bunch of fun and I kind of, you know, I kind of knew, and my heart that that was kind of my last game. I'm just laughing because er- earlier today I'm like walking through our our bedroom and I banged my knee on the bedpost and I, I just about like just fell over and, and crumpled into a million pieces and you know screamed some expletives and, and here you are you you broke you, you break your foot <laughs> and you kept playing like why like what kind of pain is it how is it even possible? Um, I didn't know it was broke. Like it felt like my like when it first happened, it felt like my shoe just came loose and I was like shit so I just tightened my shoe up real quick uh a tighter and then I just kept playing and then as the game went on I'm like shit I think this shit's broke um so but it was like I think we only had like three safeties active or it was like a whole bunch of other guys were hurt so it was like I mean we got many guys you know what I mean and you know I got an opportunity to start today so ain't no way I'm coming out of this fucking game I'm so sorry <laughs> oh go ahead no we drop them yeah, yeah. You know exactly I mean? Uh, it was no way I was coming out of the game. Um, I was having a whole bunch of fun. And, you know, in my heart, I knew that probably, you know, that was my last one. Boy, that is um, just inherent to pro football, isn't it? And I, actually, 
the book behind it, I remember talking to George Kittle about it, like just the, 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 the pressure that NFL players face just to stay on the field where there's somebody waiting in line to take your spot and make you obsolete every practice, every game. So when you're out there, I mean, just about everybody's playing through pain. And then it's like, where's your thresholds? Like, where where is that personal limit of what you can and can't do? But it, it shit that, that 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 has to hurt, though. I mean, I, I can't imagine. You, were there any any voices in your head saying, "Come on, Tavon, we know you're tough mentally, physically, but this is insanity." Uh, no. Nah, I mean, I think once you get out there, and uh, I mean, me personally, once I get out there and I make my decision that I'm going to do something, you know, and, I mean, it's kind of like signing a contract with yourself, so. Um, you know, I wanted to play in that game. I felt like, you know, honestly, coming into that year, I felt like I should have had more of an opportunity to play, um, but I did it. So it was what it was. So when I did get my opportunity to play, it was like, well, I'm going to play every play. You know what I mean? And um, I didn't know, you know what I mean, that my foot was going to break or anything like that. So um, during the course of the game, before the game, I made my decision that I was going to play the whole game. So it wasn't really a choice of, hey, I'm going to come out or, you know what I mean, it was just like, hey, keep on going. If you feel like you can still run and play and help the team, then go keep doing. So you could have came back later in the season. Like, what what happened after that? Then, yeah, um, I uh, I started practicing at the end of the year, um, and I was practicing pretty well. Never really felt like myself though. Um, never really kind of got back going like to full speed. And we were rolling as a team. Honestly, uh, we was rolling as a team. Um, I think I think we had signed another safety or something like that. So at that point, it was like, well, do you force yourself to play at this point? The team is rolling. And then, the, you know, the front office got to make decisions between releasing a player and not releasing a player. Um, so it came down to a, a numbers thing. And for me, I never really felt comfortable going back out there, you know, after that, at that point, you know what I mean? So um, I was really okay in that piece with, you know, how things ended. Because if I was the son of a gun, that's where I say that you, you guys win the Super Bowl if you're out there, right? Because you're you're, you're catching that interception in the NFC Championship game uh, against the Rams. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, yeah. that had to have been brutal for for him for a teammate of yours. Um, for for sure, man, that was definitely uh you know hard to watch. Um, and but at the end of the day, you know we all like to say we'll make that play, and when we're in that position, but we'll never know. You know what I mean? Like a lot of guys have been in that spot and haven't made that play. You know, he's not the only guy that didn't make that play. So i like to say I would have, you know, we'd have been on to the Super Bowl if that were me. But, you know, I'm not going to do that because I don't know if I would have fucking caught it. You know what I mean? I, I wish I just wish he would have caught it for our team. But it is what it is at this point. Uh, I've been grateful enough to win the Super Bowl, so I don't have no ill feelings against him. You know what I mean? Like, that's my dog. So um, I just wish he would have caught it for himself. You know what I mean? It, ain't, it wouldn't have been about me. It was more about, you know, that would have been a big time play for our team. I mean, it just popped in my head. I forgot about that. How, how did he handle that, by the way, Jaquiski Tart? Like, um, were, were honestly, close. Yeah, he, he handled it like a man. Honestly, um, you know, obviously it was hard for him, but you know, he he realized the you know the magnitude of the play. Yeah, man, Tart still talk now. Um, he, he 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 realized the magnitude of the play, and he wish he had that one back. We all have those plays. Yeah, and man, there are. I mean, we. Got into it at length, obviously, uh, a couple of years ago. But there were just so many moments in your life where you should have vanished and never even had a football career in high school, let alone college, the pros. Uh, do, do you kind of take those moments now to kind of reflect on that and realize, wow, how, how did I really kind of fight through, you know, losing your mom? She, she drowned, I believe, when you were 12. Is yeah. that right? Yeah. Uh, and then, you know, you get into college, you lose a grandfather who you're really close with, you kind of have an epiphany on busting your ass and working hard. And, you know, you got back from a game and I think you stayed up all night watching film. I mean, it was really one thing after another, like these defining moments that kind of made you who you are as a man, as a player to become a Super Bowl champ there with the Patriots. Um, where, where do you start? I guess what pro- probably your mom, but maybe there was something we didn't even get into that. Uh, you realize now that you're kind of a year removed from the game made you who you are as a person. Um, I'll just say all those moments, you know what I mean? Like uh, I'll say all those moments really, you know, helped define me, you know, who I am today, um, helped shape me who I am. Um, I don't make any excuses for, you know, the things that I've been through. I feel like um, the reason I made up the way I am is because of those things. So 
Um, you know, having to be raised by my grandmother, you know, watching her, <clears throat> watching her work two and three jobs, watching my, you know, grandfather, you know, coach football, being around the game, uh, my uncle coaching me. I mean, all those things were, you know, a part of, you know, the Tavon Wilson story, you know what I mean? The, um, it all falls under the same umbrella. And it's all about story, you know what I mean? Because my people poured a lot into me and to be able to give me the things um, that I needed to succeed because um, without them, I mean, I don't know where I'll be. And then to continue on in the NFL, you know, to have a partner like my wife and for her to be able to be there for me in, in different situations. And, you know, um, it's, it's been, you know, a whole team effort to be able to uh, help me accomplish all the great things on the field. Um, it's been a lot of work done off the field for those things to happen. Gosh, you know, I've, I've talked to players who have lost a parent, and sometimes it's so early on in your life that it, it affects you, but you're, you know, you're three, four years old. Maybe the memory isn't there. I mean, I think you lost your dad when you were one. So, yeah. uh, but your mom, I mean, you're, you're 12. I mean, you probably have so many great memories of your mom, and, and you might even remember getting the news that, that she had passed. That Did that really affect you in, in a just a, an extreme way because um, you were a little older? It did, but. Um, it affected me a lot. Um, that was probably, I think I was going to the seventh grade. Um, that was probably the first year I struggled <clears throat> ever in school, ever. So like the year after, but you know, it was something special about that. You know what I mean? Like I can remember the day of the funeral, you know what I mean? Like just getting the push to go play in a football game the same day as the funeral. I mean, and you know, my, my mom dream for me was to, uh, go to the NFL. So, you know, when she passed away, you know, that became my dream. So, um, you know, the day of the funeral, being able to get the strength to go do that <clears throat> and to realize that at a young age, you know, I knew, you know, football was my calling. So um, I put everything I could into school, everything I could into the game because, you know, I felt like that was my only way to show my mom and make my mom proud. Same day, man. I mean, so the, the funeral's what, like in, in, in the morning? Like, yeah, so lunchtime? Played, is... it was like, uh, no, nah, funeral, the funeral was in the morning, probably from like 9 to like 10, 30, 11. And then, you know, how I'd be like, um, I think, uh, repass. Everybody get together, eat food, and, you know, celebrate life. We was on our way there, and I was like, man, I don't really want to go there. Um, I want to go play in the game. And then everybody let me go play. Which is probably a turning point in that, like you're, you're able to really use football as a as an escape, as a way to just take your mind off and anything happening in your life. That point forward, I would think, if you're doing it in that moment at 12 years old, if you're losing your mom, who was like your best friend, right? You guys weren't. I mean, she, a lot of people are close to their mom, but you guys are really, really close. Mm -hmm. To do it in that moment probably um, just made you who you are at, at a young, impressionable age for for everything that happened down the road. Oh, for sure. It definitely, uh, it made me look at, start to look at things a little different. You know what I mean? Like I had, a, I got a younger sister, so um, I knew I had to take care of her. Um, so it made me grow up a lot faster than, you know, a lot of people might grow up. And then you've got friends that, it's, you know, I think like stealing cars, getting into some bad stuff. And one went to prison for a long time. It, you easily in D.C. could have just gone down that road also, and you didn't. I mean, to be honest, I mean, I got my fair share of troubles too. You know what I mean? Like, I'm not going to sit around and act like I was perfect. You know, I was just one of the guys that, you know, didn't get in the, you know, too big of a trouble that, you know, I wasn't able to get out of. You know what I mean? Like, I got into some trouble. But, um, you know, along the way, you know what I mean? Like, I had a lot of people, friends, um, people on the street. You know, like, I had a couple of the older guys from my neighborhood over my house this past weekend. And that was huge for me because, like, you know, seeing them, you know what I mean, them watching me grow up, <clears throat> you know, being outside, potentially doing the wrong things, they shaping me into who I am today. And so to be able to share these things today, kind of cracking up because, you know, those guys mean a whole lot to me, you know what I mean? And to be able to show them, you know, all that I've over, been able to overcome has been special. God, I mean, wasn't one of your closest friends – Locked up for like eight, nine years. It seemed to look, I mean, it really seemed way too steep for, for, for whatever he did. 
I mean, so like yeah. that period of life where he, he could have turned himself into an NFL player, he, Man, he, he didn't have that opportunity. He was better than me. Uh, growing up, I was a quarterback. He was a running back. And um, so a couple of my friends, you know, they used to go steal cars in uh, Virginia. And he was just with them. Like he was sleeping in the car, just with them. And kind of guilty by association kind of thing. And uh, he was 12 years old at the time. They waited till he was 13 and charged him as an adult. <clears throat> I don't understand. I mean, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Tima. They charged him. Uh, I think I think one of the guys, they only had one gun, but they charged like four or five people with armed robbery with one gun. That's what it was. That's right. He didn't have one him, himself. Like, mm -hmm. how is that even possible? Like, how how is that, our legal system? I mean, you see... You see guys go away for the, the same amount of time, if not half that amount of time, for something a million times worse. We had that situation up up here in the Buffalo area. And I I just I, I can't even wrap my head around something pet petty, you know, compared to murder and, and, and what else could, could be out there. Like your your life is ruined. Like he, his whole childhood, his whole teenage years, he's he's behind bars. For sure. And there's so many you know, so many guys behind bars like that today, you know what I mean? That, you know, for petty crimes, uh, that's over sentence um, and not getting the opportunity, you know, to, I mean, I'm not saying that, they're, you know, they shouldn't do time for the things that they've done, but, you know, over punishing people for, you know, um, drug crimes or things that's legal now, you know, I think our legal system definitely needs to, you know, start to address some of those issues, especially with, uh, you know, minorities, you know what I mean? Especially black you know, young kids are, you know, we're, they're definitely targeted. Um, my friend was in jail from 13 to 22 years old, lost all of his life for one decision. And he didn't kill nobody. He didn't um, harm anybody or I mean, he made a bad decision, you know, to get in the car and basically lost it, you know, the first half of his life. He's doing great now, proud of him, you know what I mean? Um, you know, as my brother, but, you know, I still feel some type of way about how his life was ripped away from him. I can only imagine. And and that perspective is, I would think, just at the forefront of your mind as, as you become a, a college prospect, as you get to Illinois and you, you start taking football as seriously as you do. I mean, is is he really on, on, on your brain as you're kind of turning yourself into a football player? Because you probably realize that that thin line and how easily you could be that person behind bars for something like that. Oh, for sure. Um, it was a few moments, you know what I mean, when, you know, times where, you know, maybe I wasn't thinking, you know, doing the right things. And, man, it's been a time where he, his face flashed in front of my eyes because, you know, it's one bad decision and, you know, you could be on that side too. So I carry my guy with me every day, like, you know, the whole time. Like, <sighs> And I, I just love this story in college of, uh, you know, getting back um, – from a game, I think you played Indiana, maybe like a Tandon Doss or some receiver went nuts. Yeah, my sophomore year. Yeah. And Man, you just uh, got in the film room and three, four, five, six, seven a.m. You you were there all all night, pretty much, right into the morning. Yeah, I saw. Um, we got back late that night. I think we had drove. We played. Uh, yeah, we had drove. It was like an hour and a half drive or something like that. So um, when we got back, I just went in the film room because look, he always kind of. Uh, he always go in and watch film before he go home. So he seen me, uh, seen me in there. So he was like, uh, he's like, hey, don't stay too late. I was like, all right, I got you. So he come back the next morning, like 6.37, and I'm still there watching. <laughs> so. Um, what are you watching? Like, I mean, how much film can you can you watch through through the night? And at any point are you thinking, man, I should probably get a little sleep here. This is This is kind of nuts. I watched the whole season. So, uh, um, really, yeah. So, um, during that game, I kind of lost my confidence. So, I went back, rewind, <clears throat> started to watch myself, you know, confident. So, it helped me instead of, um, <clears throat> instead of, I mean, it was bad, shit, you know, all over the internet and you know, stuff like that. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> instead of focusing on those things, it was like, well. Get back to the drone board, watch when you was good, and then make those corrections and then move forward. 
that, that's really what helped um, right to a tug of Viola. I think like this year when he was, you know, just couldn't go any other direction. And that's what he said. It's like he, him and Mike McDaniel, it's like literally watching every good play that you can possibly kind of that positive reinforcement. It's like, I mean, we're both dads. I mean, we, positive reinforcement probably works a lot better than screaming and, and negativity in general. And I, I think we kind of tend to forget that in life. Yeah, for sure. I think it's a balance, though. I think, um, mm-hmm. you know, too much positive reinforcement can be bad. I think, you know. <laughs> That's a good point. So yeah, we have way too much positive self-esteem going mm-hmm. on. There is power in a bad self-esteem. That's true. Low self-esteem. <laughs> You know what I mean? You got to be able to have, like, balance, though. You know what I mean? Like, I think balance is important. You know, I've been trying to be more balanced with my boys as far as, you know, teaching them things and, you know, not yelling at them. And, you know, but when they need to be yelled at, when they're doing something that they know they ain't supposed to be doing, then you're going to get yelled at. Like, you know what I mean? Like, hey, you know, uh, don't leave your towel on the floor. Like, you put your towel up on the rack. So if I tell you that a 100 times and then I yell at you a 100 and one time, I mean, you really can't be mad at me. You know what I mean? Like, so, um, but I definitely think positive reinforcement is, you know, that's how I try to uh, grow through all the things that I've grown through and, uh, you know, try to help the people around me, you know, grow the same way. Right. Because then when you, when you do need to speak up and be stern and the volume level has to kind of go up a few notches, it, it carries that much more weight. If it's not constant, you know, if it's just every once in a while, then it's really going to hit home. Exactly. And, exactly. And you kind of had, I want to think you had that moment really in the pros too. I mean, gosh, Bill Belichick, the greatest coach of all time, takes you second round. You're in New England. Year one's great. Year two, not so much. And you really kind of had to like whip yourself into shape, right? I mean, I, I, maybe sure. a little too much partying, a little too much enjoying the NFL lifestyle. And sure. you, you probably needed that 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 tough love yourself to get back on track. You're not you're not thinking 10 years in the NFL at that point, I'm, I'm thinking. No, nah, for sure. I wasn't thinking that far ahead at that point. Um, I think, you know, I think my granddad had passed away like a month after I got drafted. And, you know, I just went straight into playing football like I normally do. And um, that next offseason was probably the first time in my life where I had really had time to kind of relax and, um, you know, to enjoy it. And I'll say that I really didn't, you know, understanding now, you know, being older and being, you know, out of the game now, understanding where, you know, I didn't really address the issues with my granddad. And, you know, I kind of use partying and all those things uh, to kind of cope with those things. So um, that next year, probably, you know, middle through the year, you know, uh, first time in my life where I'm sitting on, the, you know, sitting on the sideline watching everybody else play. You know, I had to kind of, you know, grow up a lot faster. Um, and, you know, Bill, uh, I mean, he didn't sit me down that year and say, hey, this is what you need to do. It's like, hey, man, we're trying to win the Super Bowl. You're not fucking doing what you're supposed to be doing. I mean, we kind of going, we going this way. I mean, if you want to come, then, you know, you can come. But uh, we're trying to win a championship around here, you know. And I didn't really understand that that young. You know what I mean? I, I was coming from Illinois. You know what I mean? We won some games, but we wasn't competing for a national championship every year. But playing in New England, you know, you competing for a championship every single year. And coming in and having some success early on, I really kind of lost sight of that, you know what I mean, as a young kid. So, um, for me, looking back on it, you know what I mean, it was a great experience for me. You know, I had to grow up a lot quicker. You know what I mean? I was forced to grow up uh, in New England, and it's the reason why I played 10 years, because I understood, you know, how important, you know, those opportunities are, you know, moving forward. Because, you know, I kind of – I wouldn't say I took it for granted. I would say I really ain't know no better, you know, early in my career with the opportunity I had in New England. So, you know, moving forward, I just try to take a full uh, – for for um, uh, uh, for uh, advantage of every opportunity I got, because if you're not a second round pick, then you you probably are let go, right? I mean, if you're like an undrafted guy or a lower round pick, they they're probably moving on from the Tavon uh, Wilson business for sure. And that second year, my second year, I probably should have got cut in uh, training camp. Probably should have got cut that year. So um, didn't play well at all. It was terrible. Like I, like I had watched some of those clips, like. Man, I don't even know who that person is on that film. And then um, probably like midway through that year, things started to click in practice. I started to do better. And then I think uh, later in that season, I think I had got, got in the game versus like Baltimore or something. It's probably like my second or third play all year. And then like I catch a pick and take it for touchdown. And then um, 
everybody was really excited for me. And then going into the next year, that's when me and Chung was competing. We played a little bit and, you know, we won the Super Bowls and stuff like that. So um, I wouldn't say that, you know what I mean, in New England was a, you know, a total failure. You know what I mean? Like I'll say, you know, a lot of people got their opinion. You know what I mean? I'll say uh, for me, um, didn't play well my second year. Played behind two Patriot Hall of Famers. So um, I, I could take that. <laughs> <laughs> I think Asante Samuel is telling Lamar, don't go to New England, just run or something. People have strong opinions on Belichick and the Patriots and how they just operate day to day, one way or another. Uh, I mean, even one of your teammates, Kenny Moore, did not have a good experience, right? It took leaving and getting to Indianapolis for him to just escape depression. But you had a good experience on those lines and kind of saw the benefits of how strict like the football operation is, is run from what I remember, but is that true? And how did you interpret Belichick's coaching style and kind of how it trickles through the staff? Um, I'll say, you know, when you, when you're, uh, when you're that young and you're drafted into that, you really don't know any better. Um, and I'll say, you know, where I came from and the environment, you know, where I was brought up in, that was perfect for me. That was kind of, you know, what I needed, you know what I mean? So um, it made me grow up in the sense, you know what I mean? So, you know, um, I didn't have, you know, that type of structure, you know, growing up, you know what I mean? So for them to be able to provide that through a professional standpoint, uh, did I like it all the time? Hell no. Was it stressful? Yeah. But at the same time, I feel like it's helped me, you know, grow into, you know, you know, to do some of the things I was able to accomplish in my career. And, um, you know, it ain't all all pretty over there, but I mean the shit work. I mean, if you're a winner, <laughs> I can win. Yeah. yeah, I mean, winning don't. I mean, you can't really you you can't put a measuring stick on how far you got to go to win. You know, what I mean, if you and that, I mean, but there's so many different ways to skin a cat. You know, what I mean, I also was in San Francisco and it's totally different. And Kyle runs his show different and it's way relaxed and they still win games. You know what I mean? But mm-hmm. I feel like if I was somewhere else. You know what I mean? Early in my career, I wouldn't have played 10 years because of uh, all those things that was – I mean, because I was playing football well in New England. And then I had, like, a play here and there that was bad. And then, you know, we trying to go win the championship. And then they see all the -the off-the-field stuff kind of creeping up. They're like, well, no, we ain't doing that. On another team, they they ain't taking that young player off the field that's making those type of plays. They ain't doing that. So (laughs) for me to have to go through that, it made me reevaluate myself. Um, I'm not saying that uh, I don't think I deserve more of an opportunity in New England because, I mean, it was, a, you know, some situations there where I felt like I should have played more there too. But at the end of the day, I felt like, um, you know, it was it was a good, a good experience for me. I got I got, I got got out what I put in it, you know what I mean? Like I learned a whole bunch of football. It was around some of the best coaches in the game, some of the best players. So um, I took a whole lot out of it. Man, it's gonna harden you and just callous you for for anything in football, right? That that's your first team, your first coach. But still, I'm trying to imagine. So you're out, maybe a little too late, drinking, partying. Has to be hard to play a little hungover, and it, let let alone for Bill Belichick. I w- I would think. <laughs> I don't oh, know. Yeah. Were there any of those moments? No, nah, it would be not. Nah, uh, it wasn't like I was going out like night before games or you know practice or nothing like that. It'll be like, you know, after the game or, you know, the night before off night, oh, yeah, I'm out, you know, and I'm going to have a good time, you know what I'm saying? And yeah. Everybody knew that, you know what I mean? Like, I was going, you know what I mean? When I came in that building, you know, when I uh, when I came in the building, I was going to make sure I do everything that I could to help contribute to win. But in my off time, I was going to make sure I had a good time. But you turned it around, and then you, in Detroit, you were one of the best safeties in the NFL. Like, talking about everything off the field. Like, on, on the field, how do you hope people remember you? As a player, um, I, don't, I mean, to me, for me, it ain't about how people remember me. It's about how I remember myself as a player. Um, I think you know when I've had the opportunity to start, I feel like I played you know better than a lot of you know played as much some of the best safeties in the NFL. I mean, my, I mean, the first year in Detroit, I think in nineteen in Detroit. I mean, you can look at you know whoever you want to look at PFF, all that stuff, and. When I've had the chance to, you know, get out there and show what I can do, I played at a high level, and um, and I, I'm happy about that. You know, I'm settled on that. Um, I'm grateful for the opportunity I was having in my career. Do I wish I played more? Yeah, but I mean, everybody wish they can, you know, do a little more. But 
Um, all in all, you know, I know I gave it my all. I left it all out there, literally. So um, I have no regrets, you know, as far as football or um, or nothing about the game. You know, I'm, you know, grateful for, you know, the, the opportunity that has afforded me and my family to, you know, live, you know, beyond anything we can imagine. So um, it ain't no bad blood over here. We straight. So however they remember me, uh, that's, you know, that's for them to figure out. <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, but I, 89 you know, tackles, two picks, and 16 when you guys made the playoffs. Like, making the playoffs with Detroit, that's not like making the playoffs anywhere else. So, that's yeah, you had an impact. It was there. wild, though. So, let me tell you a quick story. So, when I got to Detroit, 16, um, they were talking about, like, doing, like, 401Ks or something like that. And I was like, well, you know, I normally contribute my 401K to, for the next year with my playoff check because in New England, we always went to the playoffs. So, you know what I mean? So I'm coming in there. I'm like, yeah, well, we're going to make the playoffs. So, you know, we're going to uh, – that's the first thing I said to this lady, Nancy. I was like, well, yeah, well, with my playoff check, you're going to contribute for next year. And she was like, playoffs? Like, we ain't been to the playoffs. I said, oh, we're going to the playoffs. <laughs> you know what I mean? So it was funny uh, to be able to make the playoffs that year. Um, man, we had a lot of good players in Detroit. Um, we really did. We had a lot of good players, man, like Slay, GQ, um, second staff, uh, Amir Abdullah, Theo Riddick. I mean, we had some players, you know what I mean? I think injuries kind of, you know, derailed us a whole lot. Uh, I wish Coach Caldwell, you know, would have, you know, had another opportunity to come back, uh, to be honest. Um, but it was what it was, you know what I mean? We couldn't get over the hump, you know, when uh, Coach Patricia got there. You know, we faced a lot of injuries and a whole bunch of shit there, too. So um, it was just two, uh, you know, just to briefly touch on that, it was just two different uh it's two totally different, you know, ways to skin the cat. Like Coach Caldwell did it over here, and then Coach Patricia came in. It was just different, you know what I mean? Like I sat in well because, you know, I had experienced it before, but um, to come in an organization, you know, that was totally different and was kind of built a different way, um, it was a culture shock for, all, you know, pretty much all of us in Detroit, you know what I mean? Even, you know, even, you know, being away for two years, being away from New England, and then, um uh, getting back into like the kind of New England feel, it was definitely a culture shock and a change from, you know, what we were used to uh, with Coach Caldwell. Well, that's like when Patricia comes in, he's probably trying to instill the same type of culture, same way of doing things that, that he had with Bill in New England, but Bill's able to point to those rings and all that winning and say, I, I'm asking you to do this because look, it, it worked. It, it, it speaks for itself where if you're just trying to, created out of thin air, maybe it's it's more difficult. I mean, a lot of his assistants just haven't worked out with other teams. I would say, um, I would say it works out with Coach Belichick because it starts with the, at the top, you know what I mean? Like when you have guys like Tom Brady, Devin McCourty, um, Dante Hightower, you know, those type of guys buying into, you know, the way you want to do things because, I mean, he drafted all of us. So, you know, um, Devin been there. All those guys have been used to doing things a certain way for such a long time. And then when you get younger guys, they just fall in line. But when you, you know, you come to a new organization and that has done things, a, you know, a little different way than what you're used to and you try to instill in that, if you don't um, find a way to kind of get, you know, your best guys to kind of you buy into that, then it's going to just be hard. You know what I mean? It's just, um, it wasn't, it's not saying that Coach Patricia is a bad football coach. I think he's a wonderful football coach. I think he, you know, a great football mind. It was just, uh, it was just two totally different um, cultures, you know what I mean? And, you know, the guys just didn't um, accept it well. Um, some of us did, some of us didn't. Um, and we just wasn't able, you know, at the end of the day, I think it comes down to, you know, the product on the field. And we just wasn't able to get the shit done on the field. I think going into game plans, like, I can look into 2019 – we, we was about to beat the Chiefs, got them fourth and eight, and we just let the quarterback scramble for a first down, fourth and eight at the end of the game. We're winning. I mean, 2019, I think we won three games, but you can look. We played against Green Bay. We should have beat them. I mean, we, we should have beat the Chiefs, and I think the Chiefs ended up playing the Super Bowl that year. I mean, yeah. how we kind of put the game plan together of how to play the Chiefs that year. I don't even think they won the Super Bowl. I don't know if they won or not, but um, we, played, we played teams tough that year. We just – didn't have uh, we on the field. We just didn't play smart enough down the stretch. Honestly, um, wasn't yeah. some it was just, it was some coaching, some playing. But ultimately, you know, we just didn't get it done. So I don't think 
it was, uh, you know, all about the culture shit. It comes down to winning football games. And, you know, we just wasn't able to get it done on the field. Dude, you ain't kidding. Thir- 34 to 30. You took the Chiefs. And the Chiefs did win the Super Bowl that year, 2019. <laughs> yeah. We should have beat them. Yeah, right, right Green there. Bay. Man. Green Bay. Like Green Bay, like Monday night or something like that. We should have beat them. It was so many games. We should have won that game that year. <sighs> yeah. It wasn't. It wasn't. In Green like, Bay would have been. I mean, twice. Yeah, 23-22. You lost uh, on Monday night. And then the last game of the year, 23-20. I mean, Man, the difference between winning and losing in football. I know it sounds cliche, but shit, it really is true. It is so razor razor thin. For sure. I mean, the, the difference between the, the good teams and the bad teams in the NFL is 30 to 34. You know what I mean? And, and the diff- I mean, that's the difference. You know what I mean? Like, um, how do a team from like the Lions last year, you know, uh, win? How, I mean, what, what pick they have last year? Um, like top 10 pick, and then they win all these games this year and play really well. Because the margin is not that far. If you can find the edge and you can get the guys to believe in your you know, your strategies and your culture, then you can find a way to win games. Like, it, ain't, it ain't rocket science. That Monday night game, too, was, weren't there like terrible calls against your defense? I'm, I'm, I'm picturing awful flags against Green Bay in that 19 Monday night game, watching that oh, one. Yeah, it was like, terrible. Yeah, it was definitely a whole bunch of terrible calls. Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, when you play in Detroit, you get the bottom end of the stick on some of those things. <laughs> like, yeah, that's right. I mean, I'm not going to lie. Like, uh, being in New England, seeing some of those balls bounce my way before and then going to Detroit and being on the other side, I'm like, come on, bro. Like, I mean, I remember I got called for, like, uh, roughing the pass on Aaron Rodgers, and I just rolled on it. And I didn't get fined for it or nothing, but it cost us 15 yards in the game, yeah. and we lose the game because of it. <laughs> Was that the same game? Yeah, well, we uh, that was the one at the end of the season. It was the end of the year. Oh, was, okay. Yeah, it was the end of the year. It's always funny how that works when you don't get fined because you should get fined, right? If it's a flag, that's an automatic fine. So when you're not, it's the NFL saying, "Oh yeah, we we screwed up." But there's no there's no press conference for an official to get asked uh, about how they just absolutely dictated who won and lost the game, and you know, they they, they get to kind of skate on by that accountability, which I don't they should like get fined. Saying. I think when yeah. they throw games like that, they should get fined and shit. When they make terrible calls, they should be accountable for those those terrible calls because, um, you know, people lose jobs because, you know what I mean, a pass interference call. So I'm going to get fired because I pass interference to the guy, but, you know, it really ain't no pass interference. You know what I mean? Like, so um, I think they should start getting fined for some of them calls, you know, especially, you know, when they're game-changing calls, like, and it's blatant, like, a bad call. It's brutal. I mean, and there's God the, the the bureaucracy with with pro football now. There's so many damn rules. I mean, the the competition committee just got together again in Phoenix, right? It's they just the rule book is probably about that that thick, and it, it's such a bang bang sport. I, I can't believe that the NFL is asking its players to make these split second decisions, especially on defense. With this, how how big, how fast everybody is. You know, especially as a DB, you're in impossible situations every every play. I I don't know how you can mentally process the way the sport is set up now. I think it's a way to play it, though. Um, you know what I mean? Like, I think it was a, you know, early in my career, we was able to, you know, get, have a little more free range and, you know, hits and things like that. Um, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a way to play the game within the rules right now and be, still, be able, <clears throat> still be able to play fast and play physical. Uh, they just, you know, defining where you can hit guys and things like that. Um, but I also feel like it do need to be some onus on the offense, like um, just to, you know, hit on the play with DeMar Hamlin um, back, like the receiver dropped his head, hit him right in the middle of his chest. Like, why? That's not crowning or some type of like offensive guys use their head as a weapon all the time. And then as soon as the defensive guy, you know, initiate contact, like it's their fault. Like, I think, you know, it should be, you know, the competition committee should look at some, uh, equal playing fields as far as, you know, calling it both ways sometimes because it's not always the defender that's dropping his head and, you know, initiating contact. It's a lot of times most of the ball carriers are dropping their head and then the defender is just trying to, you know, initiate contact in some type of way. You know what I mean? Like if he drop his head and he's already low to the ground, I don't have no surface area really to hit him. You know what I mean? So yeah. like we should, we should look at that, you know what I mean, too. Um, kind of balance it a little bit, but 
um, it's definitely uh, it's definitely a way you can play the game still fast and physical within the rules. I mean, that's good to hear because it, I, I do wonder how these guys can even, you know, play to play, be proactive and physical and aggressive because you don't want to get fined. I mean, it's your livelihood. You don't want to pay all these crazy fines too. So, yeah, I mean, it's uh, it's it's, it's an interesting league. I, I think all, all in all, I just don't want the refs like entering the equation. Like, that Super Bowl was awful. I mean, even though some of those flags should have been flags, um, nobody tunes in to watch the officials. Just – Oh, yeah. when, when push comes to shove, just swallow the whistle, just let them play. For sure. For sure. I mean, oh. I think the, the most disappointing is you see some of those things not called early in the game, and then that's some of the most crucial parts of the game that are called. So it's like, I mean, you were kind of doing business like this earlier, but now you're doing business like this, so the players don't really know. So um, that, that was kind of the sucky part. If you're going to call it one way, call it one way the whole game so we know how to do it at the most critical parts of the game. Oh hey, I, I can't thank you enough for hanging this this long, Tavon. You're, you're the man. Just how how is life today? I mean, I didn't even ask you what you're up to um, down there in North Carolina, right? With being a dad, doing everything you can with your kids, I imagine it's it's got to be nice to not worry about you know throwing yourself into this this world that we've talked about here for 40 minutes. Yeah, man, uh, it's definitely it's definitely been fun. Um, I've been had the opportunity to spend time with my family, um, coach my kids in football. I'm coaching one of my sons in basketball, helping him run track. Um, just, you know, really doing the things that I didn't have the opportunity to get done to me when I was a kid and, you know, um, form the things that, you know, I wasn't able to do with my family. So um, it's been great, man. Like, it's been a battle. I'm not going to act like, you know, it's been all, you know, it's been easy, you know, when you play, you know, uh, when you lose something, I mean, football was my life, my first love. You know everything about the game. I love it. I still watch it. You know what I mean? Like I uh, still watch sports and you know all those things. But um, when you take that big piece out of your life, it's definitely challenging to kind of feel it. And um, I've had my share of times of struggling to feel it, and I'm still figuring it out. But it's been fun. Um, it's been a challenge, but I've, I've enjoyed it. Um, I, I'm doing it with my family, so it's been. You know, I feel all the support and the things like that. Um, it's been cool. Like I go out for bike rides whenever I want, go for walks, um, do yoga when I want. Um, I mean, it's been, it's been real cool, man, to be able to, you know, um, have the opportunity uh, to, you know, enjoy the things that you worked hard for. And yeah. um, I'm blessed. I'm truly am. Boy, it really is like a drug though. You're right. I mean, for, for so many guys, cause it's like, it, it's your whole life. You got 70,000 screaming fans that the adrenaline rush, the pressure, third down, everybody watching. Like, it's hard to just be ejected from that world and detox into a nice, quiet life. I hear the birds chirping in the background out there. It's like, for me, though, for it's, me. A different, it's a different world now. It, it's a better world, a safer world, and, and you get to spend all this free time, but still, that's night and day from what you've done your whole life. For sure. Um, for me, I've always, uh, you know, I've always kind of been tunnel vision on the field and, you know, kind of know life or what I want to accomplish so like when I stepped on the field you know it was just the white lines for me you know what I mean like with the fans and stuff cool like I appreciated all those things but you know that wasn't why I was there you know what I mean like I was there for the game so you know to be able to live your dream on the field and be able to play at a high level against the best players in the world for as long as I have and now to sit back and be able to I can watch the game you know what I mean I can watch me play football for the rest of my life if I want to so that's pretty cool to me. Like, it ain't about, you know what I mean, the, the lights and, you know, all that stuff was cool. I mean, I got pictures and stuff to remember that, but I really don't, you know what I mean? Like, I don't, I don't really miss that. You know what I mean? I can still affect, yeah. you know, people in different ways in the community. I'm um, starting, you know, my own dumpster business. I uh, got some 18 wheelers um, doing those different things. So I can still provide different things to the community and be, you know, viable in that sense. And, um, without being on the football field, you know what I mean? Like, I, I'm still who I am. I can still uh, um, bring light to people in other ways. I love it. Man, it's so great, so refreshing. And I think that's a Stefan Diggs jersey behind you, isn't it? Yeah, is yeah, that's, it, is my it dog. yeah that's my dog, Steph from D.C. Oh, really? Yeah. You, oh, yeah, he's a D.C. guy. Yeah, yeah. D.C. guy. And I have, yeah. um, so... Yeah, man, I got, I'm putting up all my jerseys. I got some jerseys in here. Glover Quinn actually uh, 
He framed uh, a couple of jerseys for me. Hold on. Right here. Uh, Golden Quinn got me a couple of jerseys. Uh, he oh. doing some frames, so I got my Barry Sanders jersey right here. I like it. Yeah, so I'm getting all my cool stuff out now, framing everything up, uh, putting it on the wall. Some of my old high school plaques. My grandma put my stuff out of her house the other day. She said, you got to come get all these trophies. Some of these trophies, <laughs> like, but you can't, you know, leave all this stuff. So um, it's been fun to kind of, you know, unpack. Like, this is the first time I've had everything, you know, in one house, you know, since I've been in high school, you know what I mean? So uh, to be able to have all these things here with your family and, you know, grow your family, pour into your family. You know, it's truly been a blast. I remember I was so uh, envious and jealous when we, we did this two years ago at your old place. And you're in your basement, probably kind of slimmer now, and there's no no just toys everywhere, just chaos everywhere. It's just it's nice and clean. There's football stuff on the walls. Like our basement is just uh, just mayhem, just toys everywhere. We've got a bar. Like we, we got married, bought the basement because they had this amazing bar. And I don't think we've actually sat at it and had a drink for like two and a half, three years at least. So it's good. To, you got your toy room somewhere else. That's that's smart. Good oh, dad room. Sure. For sure. Now, this is my little man cave over here. You know, me and the fellas be hanging over here chilling. Uh, the kids over in the house. Uh, we got a pool house out here. So I just made this my little space. You know, me in my office. And you know, I do all my work from here, work out, you know, do everything from over here. So. Nah, we keep the kids. We keep the kids from over here. They uh, they they ruined the last basement. So <laughs> there you go. Okay, you you learned. I, I'll learn eventually. That's smart. Yeah, they been putting holes in the wall, especially boys. Man, man, my kids put oh. football everywhere. Like my wife, she be trying to put it, put all this stuff in, in you know the middle of the floor. I'm like, bro, they gonna play football right here. Like, just let them do what they gonna do. You know what I mean? So you won't break down and be yelling. You know what I mean? Just let them do what they gonna do. I like it. I like it. Well, man, hey, it's gr- great talking to you. Great seeing you. And let's absolutely stay in touch, Tavon. I really, really appreciate all your time again here. Uh, no problem, Tyler. Anytime, man. I love you. Enjoy it. Thank you for always including me, man. It was great. Any day, any time, man. Just invite yourself. <laughs> all right, cool. <laughs>